If you were stuck in a small town where the unstoppable serial killer Michael Myers is hunting you down, what would you do? Michael is a killing machine who will murder you when you least expect it, and that's why I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat <laughs> Michael Myers in his killer apprentice in Halloween Ends. <laughs> This mild-mannered mechanic is about to snap. Corey here is the most unpopular guy in the small town of Haddonfield. Three years ago, he accidentally killed the boy he was babysitting after a prank went wrong, causing the boy to fall three stories to his death. This accident completely ruined Corey's life. Since it happened the year after Michael Myers' latest killing spree and disappearance, the town needed someone to blame and ganged up on Corey. Back in the present, Corey's at a gas station when four high school bullies approach him. They don't have ID on them and want Corey to buy them alcohol. He refuses and the bullies start getting aggressive. They taunt Corey about being a child murderer and accuse him of being a psychopath. Backed into a corner and seething with rage, Corey accidentally shatters the bottle of milk in his hand. This encounter is nothing new to Corey. Little do the bullies know, this was their biggest mistake because Corey will soon turn the tables on them and make them pay with their lives. Original survivor Lori Strode here is one of the only town residents who isn't paranoid and resentful towards Corey. After Michael Myers disappeared four years ago, Lori has bought a house in the suburbs and lives with her granddaughter while riding her memoirs. Pulling up to the gas station, she chases the bullies away. Lori notices that Corey's hand is bleeding and drives him to the doctor's office. Inside, Corey meets Lori's granddaughter, Allison, who works as a nurse. It was Lori's plan all along to introduce Corey and Allison because they are both treated like outcasts due to their dark pasts and seem to be a good match. Allison takes an instant liking to Corey and flirts with him as they talk outside and exchange numbers. She later texts Corey, inviting him to a costume party, and he accepts. The next day, Allison visits Corey at work and they flirt some more while Corey teaches her to ride the motorcycle. While they talk, the lead bully pulls in with his father, hoping to fix the vandalized car, and Corey sees that the father is extremely mean towards his son. At the party that night, Corey and Allison have fun as they dance and take some cute photos together. Letting his guard down, he takes off his mask and goes to the bar. He runs into one of the last people he wants to see, the mother of the boy he killed. She's disgusted that he's having a good time and tears into him, accusing him of killing her son on purpose. Embarrassed and defeated, Corey leaves the party in shame, convinced that he will never be safe here and always be the town's punching bag. Coming soon to a theater near you, how to beat official Patreon. All the guts, all the blood, all the screams, plus nasty extras. How to beat Patreon. Two times the shock, two times the terror, two times the subscription levels. Have a damn good day, and it only gets better. Both levels bid you welcome to pre-sales for ghoulish official How to Beat merchandise and support the evil scientists behind the How to Beat videos. It only gets better subscribers are invited to the X-rated party. Ad-free and uncensored videos too repulsive for all audiences are available on demand. How to Beat's Patreon. In space, no one can hear you scream, but on Patreon, everyone can see you bleed. How to Beat's Patreon. Join us if you dare. Okay, if Corey doesn't stop this excessive hate from the townsfolk soon, he will wind up dead. The bullies here didn't bat an eye when they saw him get injured, and already think he killed a child on purpose. There's nothing stopping these teen bullies and any of the other angry residents in town from ganging up to assault or kill Corey if they genuinely believe he's a child murderer. Since he refuses to leave Haddonfield, his best shot to protect himself would be to give the town what they really want, their revenge on Michael Myers. He should team up with Laurie Strode, who's an expert on Michael, to lure him out of hiding and show everyone that he's dead. Michael Myers clearly has some form of superhuman power. If I were Laurie Strode, whose life mission was once to take down Michael Myers, I would make the most of this quiet time to get to the bottom of what makes him tick and how he can be killed. This means that when he does show up again, we will be able to eliminate him for good. Using my personal connection to Officer Hawkins here, I would insist that the police collect every shred of physical evidence left by Michael and examine them in a lab. A good place to start would be the street where Michael killed the mob of townspeople in 2018. Michael was shot and stabbed repeatedly here, and every single person he attacked is also dead. This means it will be very easy to match DNA to bodies and narrow down the blood sample belonging to Michael. Studying his blood would help us see what special properties it has compared to the blood of a regular person. This would allow us to uncover if there is something in Michael's biology that makes him more resilient to attacks. Understanding this will allow us to create specialized weapons or toxins that are designed specifically to 
eliminate Michael's superhuman advantages. Once we are ready to face him, the next step would be to lure Michael out so he can be killed. The Myers home would be the perfect bait because Michael has returned to it once before and we know is obsessed with staring at his reflection in the window of his childhood home. Instead of tearing it down, it should have been left up and put under round-the-clock surveillance. It can be rigged up as a prison like Lori's basement in 2018, so Michael can be locked inside and dealt with if he ever returns to the house. This would give Lori some much-needed closure and finally get the town off Corey's back. As Corey walks home along this bridge, the four high school bullies notice him while driving by and pull up alongside him. The lead bully offers an insincere apology for their earlier fight and insists that Corey shake his hand. Still upset over the night's events, Corey refuses to accept his apology. They trip Corey to the ground, crush his glasses, and start to push him around. Finally enraged enough to stand up for himself, Corey pulls out his switchblade and threatens the bullies. Corey goes to the juggler and taunts the lead bully about his father. He points out that hatred is contagious in this town and that the bully's dad must hate him as much as the town hates Corey. This hits a nerve, causing the lead bully to lash out and throw Corey off the side of the bridge. Falling two stories, Corey hits the ground below and lays motionless. The bullies are terrified that they have killed him and take off in a hurry as a homeless man who lives under the bridge looks on at Corey's unconscious body. Suddenly, Michael Myers remembers that he's in this movie and appears out of nowhere to drag Corey into a nearby sewer pipe. The next day, Corey comes to within the labyrinth of sewer tunnels. He spots the opening of the pipe and tries to leave, but Michael's hand bursts through a crevice in the wall and grabs him by the throat. Still wearing his mask and looking grimier than ever, Michael glares deeply into Corey's eyes. Corey is transfixed by the very face of evil in front of him and has vivid flashes of the boy he killed and of all the bullying the town has inflicted on him. Michael lets him go, causing Corey to stumble out of the sewer in a daze. Outside, this pushy homeless man corners Corey. He says that Michael Myers has been dragging people down the sewers for years and demands to know why he let Corey go. The homeless man quickly gets more unhinged, asking Corey to steal Michael's mask for him, then proclaiming that he is Michael Myers before lunging to attack Corey with his switchblade. They struggle for the knife, but Corey quickly gets the upper hand and stabs the man to death. Corey hurls the blade away and leaves. That's one bully down with nine more to go before the end of Halloween night. Okay, Corey here has just messed up big time by killing off his most valuable asset. Understanding Michael Myers would have been his best shot to turn his life around and stop the hateful townsfolk from coming after him all the time. The homeless man said that Michael has taken many people into the drain where they've never been seen again. This tells us that Michael does not simply kill at random, there are people he lets live on purpose. The homeless man himself has set up camp under the bridge and lived there for enough time to see Michael drag several victims away, but has never been targeted by Michael. If Corey before he can figure out what the people Michael has spared have in common, he might be able to crack the code for what drives Michael Myers and how to defeat him. One obvious trait these people share is the lack of fear. The homeless man seems a little crazy and isn't afraid of the serial killer. If this bogeyman feeds off fear, then making the town forget about him and stop living in fear may weaken him or make him less motivated to kill. Corey stands the game the most from Michael's death. Michael is the real bogeyman the town truly fears and hates, and he is just their scapegoat because Michael disappeared without a trace. This homeless this man clearly knows a lot more than he's letting on, so Corey should also have paid closer attention to what he's saying and made it a priority to get every bit of information about Michael Myers out of him. Just before he attacks, the homeless man said, Give me that mask, I am Michael Myers. This is the first clue that Michael's presence has a corrupting influence on the town or those around him. Corey has also seen this firsthand in the way his many bullies have attacked and even tried to kill him. If this is true, then killing Michael may break his influence over Haddonfield and finally allow the residents to forgive Corey. To do this, Corey should have used his information to alert the entire town of Michael's hiding spot. Since the town won't believe anything Corey has to say, he should use his mobile phone to take a picture of Michael in the sewers as proof, then post this information anonymously online. Getting the townsfolk to kill Michael can end one of two ways, with both being good for Corey. Either Michael really has a corrupting influence, so killing him releases the anger they have for Corey and each other, or killing him gives them the human catharsis needed to finally move past Corey's mistakes and leave him in peace. Later that day, Lori's at home writing when she senses something and looks out her window. She sees Corey lurking outside and watching her from behind a bush. Something is unsettling about this, and she's instantly reminded of Michael stalking her from 40 years ago. Lori goes outside to check and is startled when Corey pops out from behind her. As it turns out, he's just here to pick Allison up. 
the young lovers visit the house where Cory killed the boy, which is now abandoned. They bond over the town's residents mistreating them, as well as their shared feelings of being outsiders, and it's clear that Allison is developing feelings for this unstable young man. Later, they go for a meal at a diner where they talk about how the town has been so affected by Michael Myers' legacy that they let fear and paranoia consume them. They make plans to run away together and leave Haddonfield for good, but at that moment, this man Doug interrupts their conversation. He's Allison's ex-boyfriend and clearly still has feelings for her. Doug invites the couple to join him and his buddies, but Allison's uncomfortable and refuses. Doug gets a little too pushy and doesn't take no for an answer. Seeing this, Corey loses his temper and gets in Doug's face, yelling for him to leave them alone. The ex looks irritated but eventually backs down, already plotting his revenge against Corey. Later that night, Doug secretly follows the couple as Corey drops Allison back home, waiting to get the man alone to beat him up. Little does he know, Corey has been infected by Michael Myers' evil and is leading him into a deadly trap. The man leads Doug to the area under the bridge, but he's nowhere to be seen when the ex-boyfriend goes to confront him. Doug spots Corey's motorcycle and takes a closer look at the area. He unzips a tent and is shocked when the homeless man's body falls out. At that moment, Corey ambushes him from behind, smothering him with a coat before running into the sewer pipe. Having the world world's worst intuition, the ex-boyfriend follows him into the unknown, completely unarmed. In the darkness of the tunnels, the ex-boyfriend spots a stone wall hand-carved to look like Michael's face. This is a sign that he has entered the lair of Michael Myers, the town's ultimate boogeyman. Doug sees Corey smirking at him and looks ready to wipe that smug look off his face when Michael blindsides him. Surprisingly, Michael is weak and slow. Doug easily gains the upper hand in the struggle and knocks Michael to the ground. Corey has to step in, hitting the ex-boyfriend in the face repeatedly till he's dazed and helpless. He shouts for Michael to show him how to kill and looks downright gleeful as Michael pulls his signature kitchen knife out of a hiding spot in the stove. The boogeyman stabs Doug again and again as Corey holds him down. As the life drains from the man, the murderer trembles and appears to get stronger. That's two bullies down with they to go as Michael and Corey's rampage really gets started. Okay, Doug here has to be the world's worst cop. He has the advantage over Corey in almost every way and somehow manages to turn his plan into a huge disaster. Looking at Corey's behavior, it is clear he has an extremely short fuse and is willing to get into physical confrontation. This means Allison is in serious danger because these are the classic telltale signs of a violent man. Even if Corey hasn't hurt her yet, he has an unhinged personality and there's no telling when he may unleash his anger Allison's way. Doug needs to get him away from her and using his position as a cop is the best way to do it. Instead of backing down, if I coached Corey to throw the first punch at me in public, we would be able to lock him in jail for assault. While this plan can carries a risk that we may get hurt, at least I know six of my friends are at a table nearby and will have my back if things go awry. If Corey somehow doesn't fall into our trap, the town already hates Corey, while we are well connected and surrounded by friends, many of whom are likely cops. If I gathered all my cop buddies and asked them to speak with Corey's neighbors and co-workers, it's likely we would be able to uncover evidence of Corey breaking the law in some way. At the very least, information will surface about Corey vandalizing cars, and we can use this to place him under arrest. This is far safer than confronting hunting Corey alone in a dark sewer. Instead of getting Corey away from Allison the proper way, Doug underestimates him and follows him. This was his biggest mistake. He doesn't even try to be discreet when tailing Corey's motorbike, driving with his headlights on, and staying less than a block behind Corey on this completely empty road. This makes it extremely easy for Corey to see and hear his car, giving him all the time he needs to plan for a trap to lure Doug into. The ex-boyfriend should remember that he considers Corey a murderer and should treat any confrontation with him the same way he would approach an armed and dangerous dangerous suspect. Rather than going straight under the bridge when following Corey into this dark and quiet part of town, Doug should have walked parallel to it along the motorway so he can see behind each pillar and make sure that Corey isn't hiding behind one to ambush him. Doug should also have packed his service pistol and taser, which would have been useful to subdue him before he escapes down the pipe, and certainly very useful to have when ambushed by Michael Myers. After killing Doug, Corey goes to visit Allison at the Strode house and they sleep together. Lori looks on at the couple as they head upstairs, unaware that Michael Myers is now in the loose and has followed Corey to her house. The next day, Lori talks with her old friend at a bar. She's convinced that Corey has been overtaken by Michael's evil. The father of the boy Corey accidentally killed is there too. He tells Lori that he has run into Corey recently and agrees with her that Corey is no longer the boy next door he once knew and that he has become something closer to the town's boogeyman. 
making Lori certain her granddaughter is in grave danger. At work, Allison is annoyed when her boss and this nurse continue to treat her rudely. The doctor acts like Allison is his servant and doesn't even try to hide the fact that he gave the nurse Allison's promotion because they are having an affair. That evening, the doctor and nurse arrive at his luxury house for some naughty fun. The doctor opens some champagne with a corkscrew and tells his lover to put on the robe he has bought for her. As the woman is getting ready, she hears a crash outside and goes to take a look. She walks onto the patio and sees some broken glass on the floor. Sensing that something is very wrong here, she flips on the lights and screams in horror as she sees Corey in a scarecrow mask, brutally stabbing the doctor with the corkscrew. There is blood everywhere and there's no saving the man. Knowing her lover is dead, the nurse runs for her life. She manages to outrun Corey and makes it inside first, locking the glass doors as Corey pounds on them angrily. The nurse starts to call the police but sees something very strange. Corey has stopped trying to break in and is just staring at her in wonder. She hears a door behind her opening and spins around, but it's too late. Michael Myers enters the house, lifts her by the neck, and slams her against the wall. Corey takes off his mask and watches from outside as Michael stabs woman through the chest and pins her to the work of art. With Michael and Corey working together, that's four bullies down with six to go. Okay, this nurse here completely panicked, and that was her biggest mistake. The first thing she should have noticed is that there are no tools or bags near the patio doors, or beside Corey where he is stabbing her lover. This rules out robbery as a motive, as the intruder has shown up without the tools to break into any safes, or the bags to carry loot out of the house. This means that the masked man's main goal is to murder her and her lover. The nurse should also have recognized the intruder's hair and scarecrow mask instantly, and known that it is Corey who has come to kill them. This is the same mask she saw Corey wearing to the costume party she attended with Allison. Knowing that Corey has broken into the doctor's house and that he has come to kill them, this woman should have put these two pieces of information together and figured out that he's doing this for Allison. If Corey is willing to kill people he thinks has wronged his girlfriend, that he must be absolutely desperate to make her happy. This nurse should have played on that, lying that she's Allison's close friend and that would make the girl heartbroken if she died. She could also have made up a story that Allison's boss has given her partial ownership of his business and that since he's now dead, she will have the power to advance Allison's career to new heights. Corey would likely believe this story as he can see that she's having an affair with the doctor and that he enjoys lavishing her with gifts. Once she convinces Corey that she needs to live for Allison's sake, she can use him against Michael Myers. If I were the nurse here, I would ask him to be my protector and escort me to my car so I can get away. If Corey is between me and Michael Myers when Michael does show up to kill me, it is likely he will not hesitate to attack Corey too for getting in the way of his victim. Tricking the two killers into fighting gives us an opening to get to the car and escape with our lives. The same night, Corey and Allison visit one of his favorite spots in the town, the local radio station. Corey tells her that sitting on the roof and looking up at the radio tower gave him some comfort after the town condemned him for the little boy's death. Corey jumps off the roof as a joke and startles Allison. Hearing the ruckus outside, the radio DJ comes out and scolds the couple. He demands they leave and after recognizing them both, mocks Corey and Allison for their past traumas. Realizing that everyone in the town will continue to bully them and treat them like freaks, Corey and Allison grow even more convinced of their plan to leave Haddonfield together. Corey then returns home where his overbearing mother is furious that he has a girlfriend and has stayed out all night. She slaps him hard in the face and looks horrified at herself. Full of remorse, she tries to kiss her son on the lips to apologize, but Corey is disgusted and leaves home. The next day, it is Halloween in Haddonfield. After spending the night at the abandoned house of the boy he killed, Corey returns to the sewers and wrestles the mask away from Michael. Meanwhile, Lori sees Allison packing to leave town and tries to warn her about Corey. Allison doesn't believe her grandmother and the two have a huge argument where Allison blames Lori for all the people Michael Myers has killed. She remains resolved to leave town as well as her grandmother and slams the door in Lori's face so she can continue packing. Across town, the four bullies emerge from a store to find that Corey has vandalized their car, carving the word psycho into its hood. They spot Corey on his motorbike nearby, and he taunts them to follow. The teenage bullies immediately follow Corey into his obvious trap. Corey leads them to the scrapyard. The lead bully spots Corey's motorbike and tells this drummer boy to prep the car to drag the bike around. When he takes too long, the lead bully goes to check, finding that Corey has killed the boy by running his drumstick through his eye. At that moment, a truck roars to life and speeds towards the two female bullies. They run for the exit and climb over a fence, but this girl is too slow and gets run over by the truck. Still alive, she's hurt badly and pinned to the ground under the fence. 
As her friend checks on her, Cory catches her from behind and kills her with a wrench. The lead bully runs to the main office for help, where he catches the attention of Cory's boss, who is also his stepfather. The boss gives the bully a shotgun and arms himself with a pistol, asking the lead bully to stay put while he helps the women. Outside, he sees Cory with the Michael Myers mask, but before he can talk to his stepson, the lead bully tries to shoot Cory and kills the boss instead. Seeing that Cory has disappeared, the bully runs up to his friend trapped under the fence, only to be ambushed from behind. Cory, now dressed fully as Michael, incinerates the boy's face with a blowtorch. He then advances on the girl under the fence and stomps her head in, killing her instantly. With the scrapyard massacre complete, that makes eight bullies down with two to go. Okay, these teens walk straight into a death trap and only have themselves to blame. This scrapyard has bad news written all over it and is the worst possible place to get into a fight with Cory. The lead bully has seen Cory here before and knows he works at the scrapyard. The place is massive and filled with cars and machinery, and Cory will know its layout and every hiding spot like the back of his hand. Since he has lured them here on purpose, it makes sense that Cory has already rigged the entire yard with traps. The hazards here, such as this industrial shredder, are perfect for killing someone and making it look like an accident. If the teens don't want to recognize Cory's home ground advantage and run away to fight him another day, the least they could have done is come up with a plan to turn the tables on this Michael Myers wannabe. While being near Michael Myers may have taught Cory a thing or two about killing, this still gives the teens far better odds because they outnumber him 3 to 1. If each of the teens grabs a heavy tool or sharp object from the many laying around their scrapyard, they can overpower Cory. One thing the teens should have noticed right away is that Cory is wearing the actual Michael Myers mask. This means that it won't matter even if Cory gets away. In fact, it might be a better idea to keep Cory alive because he has just become the town's best lead to track Michael down. As observed during his previous rampage, Michael is very attached to his mask. This means that if Cory is allowed to get away and the police assign undercover officers to tail him, sooner or later they will track down Michael Myers when he comes after Cory to get his mask back. Still dressed as Michael Myers, Cory returns home where his mom is watching TV. Without her knowing, he gets a knife from the kitchen and sneaks up behind her. She spots him in a reflection and screams, but it's too late. Cory kills her before she can even get up. With this overbearing woman dead, that's nine bullies down and only one one more to go. Cory heads out to the radio station to find the DJ who was rude to him. This receptionist is cutting up some paper decorations when Cory barges in and kills her. The DJ is on air, playing music on an old timey record player, and doesn't hear his co-worker die. Cory grabs the man by his hair and smashes his face into the table again and again, breaking his jaw and knocking more than a few teeth out. He then cuts off the DJ's tongue and lets it fall on the record player as the song continues to play across Haddonfield. With the DJ slaughtered for his smart mouth, all ten of Cory's bullies are dead. Lori is alone at home, thinking Allison is gone for good after their argument. She falls back in bad habits and takes a bottle of alcohol to her room. After downing a shot, she unlocks a safe and takes out a revolver. She doesn't notice that someone has entered her house and is right outside her room. Lori calls the police and reports a crime, but outside the room, a shape creeps up to Lori's door as she pulls the trigger, splattering the wall in red. Just then, the shape spots a destroyed pumpkin on the floor and looks up to see Lori staring him down over the barrel of her gun. She she shoots him twice in the chest, sending him stumbling backwards and crashing through the banister to the floor below. Badly injured, he removes his mask to reveal Cory, who has now been completely consumed by the evil of Michael Myers. Lori gets up close and challenges him to do what he came for, but the boy dies from his injuries. Even Lori is caught off guard by this, but in the worst possible case of bad timing, Allison walks in at that moment to find her grandmother standing over Cory's body. She screams at Lori and runs away, thinking her grandmother has killed an innocent man. Left alone, Lori is dejected and sits on her kitchen floor. Just then, she notices the back door is open and realizes someone else is in the house. The real Michael Myers stalks through Lori's hallway and reaches for Corey's knife, but Corey isn't dead yet. He grabs weakly at Michael and screams in terror as Michael snaps his neck. In the kitchen, Lori has locked herself in the pantry. She knows that Michael Myers will come for her and readies herself for a showdown 40 years in the making. Okay, Lori here completely outwitted Cory. Knowing that Cory has been infected by evil, Lori outsmarts him by drawing from what she knows about Michael. He stalks his victims before killing, and he likes to get up close to watch them suffer. This is how she plays to Cory's instincts to eavesdrop on her call to the police, and makes him desperate to approach her room so he can have the joy of killing her first. While these are some brilliant tactics, I would cover all my bases even more if I were in Lori's shoes. The first thing I would do is steal Allison's phone instead of arguing with her. Couples 
often have location tracking enabled for each other, and I could use this function or pretend to be Allison to convince Cory to turn it on. This will allow us to track Cory's movements across town and know exactly when he has shown up to kill me. This has the added benefit of tricking Cory into thinking Allison is home too. If he thinks his girlfriend will be in the house, this means he will not show up with Michael because there's no way he will risk Michael killing Allison. Cory also loves chocolate milk. For good measure, I would buy a bottle, fill it with rat poison, and leave it in the fridge in case Cory stops for a drink when he breaks into the house. This is worth a shot because Michael Myers is known to visit his victim's kitchens to get a weapon, meaning Cory might do the same and spot the poisoned drink. One thing Lori overlooks is that she lets her guard down too early, right after getting the upper hand over Cory. She does not seem to notice that he's wearing Michael Myers' mask when it should be setting off major alarm bells. If she had paid attention, she would instantly realize that Michael is back and that her and everyone she knows is in serious danger. With this in mind, she should have promised to spare Corey's life if he gives information on where Michael is and how they are connected. While this is a long shot, Corey might fall for it just for the chance to see Allison again. Once Corey has shared what he knows or if he refuses, Lori should then eliminate his threat entirely by shooting him in the head, then turning her full focus to preparing for Michael's inevitable attack. Michael Myers enters Lori's kitchen and notices the sounds from the pantry. Just as he's about to open the door, Lori bursts through and hits him with a fire extinguisher. Michael regains the upper hand and slams her head into a glass cabinet. They struggle for a knife in the sink, but Michael grabs Lori's hand, turns on the garbage disposer, and forces her hand down towards the spinning blades. Lori pulls away just in time, but is thrown across the room before getting stabbed with a knitting needle. As Michael tries to force the needle through her skull, she pulls at his mask. This distracts him enough for Lori to stab Michael in the hand with his own knife, pinning him to the kitchen island. She stabs him in the chest, but that doesn't slow Michael down. Lori grabs another knife and skewers his other hand to the island, then toppling the refrigerator on top of Michael, pinning his leg to the counter. With Michael completely immobile, Lori slowly pulls his mask off. Lori slits his throat and stands over him as the blood drains from his body. Suddenly, Michael breaks free and grabs Lori by the throat. Unable to move, she screams at Michael, accepting that they're about to die together. But at that moment, Allison bursts in, yanking Michael's arm off Lori and breaking it, saving her grandmother. Now free, Lori is determined to kill Michael off for good. She cuts him open and Michael bleeds out all over the kitchen floor. Sometime later, the police arrive to find both Corey and Michael's bodies. Allison has her first good idea in days and proclaims that Michael is not dead enough. With that, the two women take Michael's body outside and tie it to the top of their car. The police escort them through town. Soon, more and more of the townspeople notice and a long line of cars and people start following. The entire town has rallied to see the boogeyman who has haunted their thoughts for so long be destroyed for good. They end up at the scrapyard. A crowd of Haddonfield residents and Michael's past victims gather around the metal shredder, helping to carry his body from the car to the machine's platform. Allison turns the shredder on, and Lori takes a deep breath before pushing Michael's body into the jaws of the machine. His body folds inwards as it is crushed, tearing into a million pieces till his skull finally explodes in a bloody mess. Some days later, Lori finishes writing her memoirs. She and Allison make up, and Lori gives her granddaughter her blessing to leave town like she has always wanted. Lori hears something at her door, and sees that her old flame has left her some groceries. They sit on the porch steps together talking about cherry blossoms and about embracing rife. Lori is finally at peace. She knows that Michael Myers is gone, but acknowledges that evil could take many forms and will never truly die. Michael's mask sits harmlessly on her coffee table, serving as a grim reminder for what Lori and everyone else should have done in the first place. Get the f*** out of Haddonfield. But what do you think? How would you be Halloween ends? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.